the introduction that I have for Nicole is that, you know, she wrote this awesome book for the love of soil and it was probably the only kind of technical book that I've ever read that I, that I finished the book and I started reading it again. Anyway, let's get started. Let's Thank you. That. Thank you. Wow, I recognize so many of your names or your ranches. It's a, it's a real honor and a pleasure to be here in front of you today. Um, you're probably wondering what on earth is a New Zealander doing talking to Colorado ranchers about soil health? I do wonder that myself sometimes, <laughs> it's fine. So, um, let me see, we're missing, we're missing a clicker. We're under control, it's fine. Um, oh, let me show you. No, I found it. It's not that one. No, I got it. Okay, good. Good, oh, good, good. <laughs> Uh, so with my company, Integrity Soils, I've been coaching and consulting around predominantly New Zealand and Australia for the first 10 years. And then I came here in 2013. I got invited by Ranching for Profit to speak at one of their big conferences. Who's done Ranching for Profit? Half of you? Yeah. And um, that, that was pretty extraordinary. Um, there's something in me that's, that is really attracted to the dry landscapes. Coming from New Zealand, that seems very, very odd. But I'm also really passionate about how do we bring life back to communities. And uh, living, I was living in a small town called Waipukuro. Waipukuro means where the two streams, where the fungus grows. That's what it literally translates in Māori. And we had one of our uh, pack houses shut down and the community started to fall apart and drugs came in pretty hard and fast and gangs and my son had a home invasion and I just got really connected to how do we bring life back to communities? How do we, how do we re restore that? And it starts with soil. Uh, so I work with pretty much every sector. So I've worked in turf, in racing, in um, I started in orcharding, commercial composting, uh, cropping, bison, doesn't matter what you've got. I as long as we've got soil, we've got something that we can talk about, right? So in 20, January 2019, I, I did a trip around Australia and I was working with some different farmers and, and doing workshops like this. And I drove from Adelaide, which is here, all along this coast, along here to Canberra. And then I got a train and the train took me from Gold Coast up to Townsville up here. And the entire time, there was nothing. Like there was dust, dirt, and cows that looked like leather stretched over sticks. You know, like they would have been put down by the Humane Society, except everybody's livestock looked like that. So they're at the end of a 10 year, pretty severe drought. There was nothing left. And you could feel it. And you can feel this right now in Montana it feels explosive. It feels like the whole landscape's about to go on fire. Um, there were dead kangaroos on the side of the roads. Like the wildlife themselves had run out of feed and run out of water. So after this trip, I was starting to feel quite depressed. Like it was a physical sensation of like, we are so screwed. Like, and then I pulled up to this operation. It's called Jillamatong. It's in New South Wales. Um, they are about an hour and a half from Canberra. Um, and this is what the property looked like when they first brought it. So it had a lot of eroding, um, what do you call them? What do you guys call them? Gullies. Gullies? We can say gullies, yeah. Not, no weird Americanism. Arroyos. Oh, arroyos. Very good. So, um, and, and just, uh, he had hydrophobic soils. So soils that literally are afraid of water. Does anyone have any of those on their place? Would you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we've seen a little bit of that too with that, that rainfall that just happened. Um, is seeing that water hits that surface and just rushes off. That's not what we want to see in any landscape. What he did was um, he put in leaky weirs and different types of water systems to slow the water movement down. So this is um, one of those sections of a leaky weir. They also did holistic grazing, so they're getting their grazing management right. How do we define even what holistic grazing or adaptive grazing management is? How do you guys define it? Time control. Time control so how long they're in, a, in an area? Yep. Plan. That you plan, plan it? Grazing. You're going to plan your grazing ahead of time? Yep. Asking 
you know, asking land what it can offer rather than assuming. That is the most beautiful answer I've ever heard <laughs> to this question. Thank you. Uh, how else do you how else do you designate this is this is whole systems grazing? This is adaptive. What are you doing? What are you making decisions based on? Yeah, yeah, really good. So looking down. And then how do you know if it's time to come back? So full full recovery of a plant. Okay, very good. So these are the practices that he practices. He will never come back into a field if it's not ready. He will destock before he will ever come back into a field. So his driver is there must be ground cover, there must be, even if it's just stalks, there's got to be something in there or he won't come back in, which is ruthless, right? And I've been on some op operations lately that are HMI certified that are coming into bare ground. You're ringing the death knell on your property at that point, right? So he practices what they call natural sequence farming, which uh, is similar to the, um, the artificial beaver dams that I'm seeing some people are starting to build. So how do we slow water down? He practices biodynamics, I'm not gonna get into that, um, and maintaining ground cover, all right? When I got to his place, so I've been just driving through dust and I turn up and he's, he's got grass and he had cows that were even a little bit too fat after seeing these skeleton cows, right? And they were literally skipping. Like you've seen cows skip when they skip. You're like, those are the happiest cows. Um, and uh, as we drove around, we found fungi. So we found 12 different types of uh, mushrooms. One of the things that he's found on the property is um, this, and I think I've got the name. So Cordyceps gunnii. Have you heard of Cordyceps? It's, it's in my book. Some of you, I take it. Um, it's for stamina, endurance, and heart health. What it is, is it's a, it's, a, it's a mushroom growing inside a caterpillar. Can you see that? So there's the caterpillar, and there's the mushroom. So the entire thing turns into a mushroom. Um, the 2000... Uh, women's Chinese women's Olympic team were uh, kicked out of the Olympics for taking this because it imp improved stamina. So he started to make a tincture to see what would happen, gave it out to all the blokes in his local community, uh, worked so well that all the women gave it back to him and said, thank you, we're fine. <laughs> <laughs> we don't need it. But uh, as a high value product, <laughs> this, this mushroom is worth a fortune. Um, it does grow in the United States, yes. Yeah. yeah, I haven't looked, oh, I have. Colorado does have three or four different varieties. It will grow in grasshoppers. It will grow in uh, millers. So there's a whole conversation to happen about how do we get the fungi back to, to start to control these things. All right, what was super interesting is um, we, were, we were standing up to the right here, the property goes, there's a fence line and it goes to his neighbors and he's like, feel my grass. And we're like, ooh, it's so soft, nice grass. He's like, okay, let's jump the fence and feel the neighbor's grass. And we got used to doing this. We jumped the fence and we did that and it was covered in spikes. And it was like, ow. And it was like the neighbor's place was saying, get off, go away, get off, let this land recover. When it rains, the rain comes across the neighbor's property as a sheet of water hits his place and disappears. Right? Now, you'll, if you want to Google Jilamatong, you will find uh, he's been in the news a lot because the local town ran out of water. There is no running water anywhere in this district. There are no streams, there are no rivers, yet a river starts on his place and comes out of his place. He's selling water to the local town uh, and in fact, he had a fire come through. He's had two big fires come through and the, they could put the fire out because he had water for the monsoon buckets, right? He's rehydrated that landscape so that it operates like a sponge again so that it holds onto water when you get heavy rain like we just got now. It's not heading off to the neighbors. It stays on your place and slowly releases over years, right? So he has a river. It's really worth um, checking him out. He's been part of the Soils for Life project in Australia for 20 years, and he produces all of his financials as well. He's 230% more, uh, his, his net gross, net, is 230% higher than the average for the area, right? So he's doing this profitably while bringing life back to landscapes. Are any questions about him? How do his neighbors look at it? 
this is the thing, isn't it? Like neighbors will look over the fence and think you're not you're not stocking enough. That's what they say. You haven't got enough livestock. You got a rain that they didn't get. Oh, you got rain they didn't get. I get that all the time. <laughs> his biggest problem has been kangaroos. So he, he lost all of his uh, deferred grazing this year to kangaroos. So he's investing now in, in fencing. He's just going to keep the kangaroo out. But there was no grass for kangaroos anywhere. So every kangaroo in like a 100 mile radius moved onto his place, which would be fine if you got into like commercial kangaroo production <laughs> or something, but he's not. All right. Uh, so last month, uh, last year during um, COVID, I just thought I'm just going to go and sit somewhere for a couple months. So I went to Older Spring Ranch with Glenn Alzinger. Do you know, guys know the Alzingers? Pretty cool. Have you been out there? No. All right. So I spent two months um, with the interns practicing what they call in herding. So they're 46,000 acres. If you drive from Chalice to Salmon, that's the countryside, you can see in there that's all scoria. Uh, it's volcanic tough. It's nasty. Like my, sh my horse wore his shoes down through that process of being on these rocks, right? So that in herding process, the interns live with the cattle, we sleep with the, well, not literally sleep with them, but, you know, like, <laughs> they got a corral for the, uh, a night pen for cows, um, and then they come out every day, and they graze and come back, so we'll go out to water and then come back. They never travel over the same ground twice, and if they travel over the same ground twice, they'll move fast, right? Uh, their goal is that there's no repeat bite, so those cows will drift through these landscapes, and they might take one bite from four plants and then they kind of keep moving on. So the, the definition for me about overgrazing is the, is the repeat bite when a plant is regrowing, right? So you can come across and graze it to the ground if you wanted to, which I wouldn't do here, but um, then it's allowing that plant to recover. So some of these areas have only been grazed once in the last six years. Some of them have been grazed every year, depending where they are. And as a result, what they've done is they've doubled their organic matter. They've gone from 2% to 4.5% in six years, which is extraordinary when you look at the country that they're on. Uh, there's been a 300% increase in ground cover and plant diversity. And what blew me away was watching these cows is how, how much forbs they'll eat and how much forbs they choose to eat. And I'd say probably 60% of their diet was forbs. Right, they're going for the balsam arrowroot. They're going for um, arrowroot balsam, sorry, uh, astragalus. They're going for the legumes. And, and then they're still eating grass, but just it really kind of blew me away in looking at that, that picture. So um, I think the idea of having seven, seven interns, I don't know how feasible that is. La this year they had 280 applicants for a job that advertises no pay hard long days, lots and lots of hard work. Uh, the only thing they promised was clean water and beautiful clear night stars. That's, that's all they promised and they got 280 applicants for a job that doesn't pay. There's young people wanting to reconnect with these landscapes, right? They had such trouble choosing, I think they just threw the papers in the air and then randomly chose, you know, 10 interns out of that. But anyway, any questions about this? I think they're maintaining the same stocking numbers. Um, profitability be interesting because it's such a big family. A lot of the profits are going back into maintaining family and uh, they haven't published that profitability data. It would be an interesting thing. They're selling a certified organic direct marketed product. So I think they're doing well on that end. Sell for more money per head. Yeah, so they're definitely getting more money per head, but um, they're cautious, you know, and I think a lot of people are cautious about not overstocking as such because what's the difference between 400 head to 600 head when you're running it like this like but um they are cautious uh yeah anyway it was a pretty fascinating um experience all right so everything comes back to soil health if we're talking about climate regulation or water quality or the quality of fishery beds what's happening with the great barrier reef uh, food quality, human well-being, and planetary health, everything comes back to soil health. <coughs> Can you think of something that doesn't relate to soil health? It's good, as long as we're in agreement, it's fine. <laughs> my son came up with sound and light, because my son's a genius, obviously. But uh, 
Yeah. Everything comes back to soil health. And so, you know, I studied soil science um, and finished in 1999, and my passion has never failed. I might have changed the, the things I'm focusing on, but the passion for soil health has never changed. And I feel like it's a, it's a door that once we open, we can never shut again. You know, if we can just get the neighbor to look over the fence and start to think about soil health, they can't close that again once we find a way to, you know, value soil health. So we can't do anything about the weather, and I'm going to say mostly because I'm seeing some freaky stuff happening on some ranches where they're rehydrating landscapes. And they're doing that through ground cover. They're doing that through what we call the volatile organic compounds. They're doing it through microbiology. So think about who seeds clouds, who rehydrates landscapes is all about microbiology and specifically fungi, right? So I'm putting in a proviso mostly. So there's people in Australia that are actually buying land upwind from them to rehabilitate and regenerate to provide more rainfall to them, right? So they're getting a rainfall response from, from buying upwind. So there's things we can influence, all right? So we can do things about water holding capacity, we can do things about runoff, infiltration, uh, erosion, and then how plants respond to stress, frost, drought, heat, temperature. You guys probably don't have any of this stuff, like the club moss out here. No, so it's further north. So soil is our greatest resource and our greatest export. So Dust Bowl USA, Dust Bowl Australia. Soil level. Ah. All right, so these Dust Bowls weren't just happening here. They were happening in Russia. They were hap New Zealand's Dust Bowl happened in the 1950s. It was more like a mud bowl, but we had the same effect happen, right? So we are exporting huge amounts of soil and we continue to do it today. You guys seen these dust storms? Are you getting them? No, you're lucky. The roads up in Montana have been shut because of visibility, like not being able to see car accidents and all the rest, right? Um, so for every ton of grain produced, the US loses one to two gr tons of topsoil, uh, but on average, Americans lose four tons of topsoil per acre per year, and on some properties, like in Iowa, they were losing 50,000 pounds, or uh, I heard someone say 100,000 pounds, of topsoil per acre per year. So think of that one ton, it's about the equivalent of a sheet of paper. So everybody's losing this sheet of paper every year and it's like aging. You know, you look in the mirror and suddenly, crap, when did that happen? You know, like, it just sneaks up on you, right? So <laughs> this sneaking up thing continues to happen here in the US and it's like our hidden insidious we thing we're just going to not talk about is the amount of soil losses, right? So I want to talk a little bit about soil carbon because it's getting a huge amount of attention right now, all right? And I don't think about soil carbon as being separate, right? It's part of that whole system and I'm, I'm quite concerned about marketplaces that just focus on carbon, all right? We need to be looking at what's happening with water, what's happening with biodiversity, what's happening with social systems, right? But just to think about carbon, a 1% increase in carbon holds on to an additional 24,000 gallons per acre of water. What is that the equivalent of in rainfall, do you know? An inch of rain. Yeah, it's an inch of rain, that's right. Do that, inch of rain. Okay, so at one time, so there's a wetting and drying cycle through the season, right? So it could actually be as high as three times that amount. So that one inch of, of carbon could be holding on to 72,000 gallons of water per acre per year. How much carbon have you lost? Do you guys know what, how mu what the carbon figures are out here? We no. Don't we don't have a starting point, right. Um, there's been some work where they've found areas that have been undisturbed, but I'm like, that doesn't mean it's natural, you know, because it's not been grazed by anything. Like the antelope and the deer can't there go there, that doesn't mean it's natural. But uh, looking at other data around the world, they actually had someone that came through Australia, Streslowski was his name, and he actually measured soil carbon before the arrival of sheep. And he sampled all along that coastline where the fires were, and in some of those places he found organic matter levels as high as 30%. And you go back to those places now and they're down at 2% or 1.5%. Right. They say that after the arrival of sheep it only took three years for that topsoil and all of that soil and all of that sponge to disappear three years. So we don't even have a marker to really go back and say, what did Australia even look like? 
right? And the same thing happened here. They estimate that you guys have lost between 30 to 60% of your carbon in Colorado, right? And that's models, all right? They're just pie in the sky stuff. But let's say you did lose 3% and we're being nice to you. Um, then that could be the equivalent of up to 216,000 gallons of water storage. And it's the equivalent of about $2,000 of fertilizer in terms of NPK, sulfur, all of that that's bound by carbon. Now, what would be possible if you had that? What do we say that was? Three. That's nine inches of water storage. What difference would your place look like with that? Could you carry some more cows? Could you grow some fungus? <laughs> we could do some things, right? So what could be possible? So a one inch of rainfall is estimated to grow 400 pounds of an alfalfa hay. So 3% carbon could be growing an additional 3,600 pounds of alfalfa, which could be the equivalent of 78 to $230 an acre in just in hay production, right? This is one thing I want you to start looking for is solid stems in your alfalfa. I am not seeing that on most properties, right? We're seeing hollow stems. It's the sign of a nutrient deficiency. Does anyone know what it is? Do you remember what I said yesterday? No. Nope. Right, it's boron. So boron is what, uh, you'll see that in broccoli too in the grocery store. If you ever see broccoli with a hole in the bottom of it, that's a boron deficiency, don't buy it, right? But if we have boron deficiencies in our alfalfa, then we see hollow stems. You're losing probably 30% of your production. And what, we, what we're finding is if we t add a tiny amount of boron, I'm talking about tiny amounts to hay fields, the weight of those bales increases by about 25%, just from that tiny, tiny bit of boron, all right? And then what boron does is move those sugars through the plant and down the root systems, all right? And what I'm seeing, I don't even, like I work with, I think some of the best holistic, adaptive, whatever you want to call it, grazers on the planet, and they're missing boron. And then they're not pumping sugar, they're not building carbon, they still have bare ground, even after 30 years, right? So there's some funky things that start to happen as we start to build soil health. Now this photograph is, it's a, it's a tomography, so it's a type of x-ray machine, and it's x-raying down to three inches, and it's looking at the empty spaces in a soil. So this is standard conventional horticultural management in this case, and then this is regenerative management. What you're looking at, the dark is the soil, and the light is pore spaces. These soils have more air and water in them than they have actual soil, and you can feel it. It's spongy. It holds on to water and releases it as the plant needs it. They're absolutely phenomenal. They did some work on this and found they applied 2,4-D on both of these soils because that's what scientists like to do, put a bit of 2,4-D on. The 2,4-D on this soil just sat there and it was all available. When they put it on this, they couldn't find it and they thought, all right, some idiot forgot to do it. Do it again, same thing. When they measured the 2,4-D in the soil, there was none. Where has it gone? Carbon neutralized it, close. Who's in there? Who's in that soil? Yeah, yeah, so it's all your fungi and your bacteria and what they do is what they call um, bioremediation or microremediation and they break that 2,4-D. So those of you who don't know what that is, it's a type of herbicide. They break it down to its component parts. It's no longer available. That microbiology, they might eat each other and they keep it out of that soil system. So if we have a very um, healthy biological system like this, there's a whole lot of resilience, right? There's a resilience in terms of difference in temperature. These soil temperatures, and I've got an example which we might not get to, um, we measured soil temperatures that were 70 degrees difference between this to that, 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You could feel it. You couldn't even put your knee on this soil. It was so hot. And I'm talking, we're only looking at a centimeter down, but there was 70 degrees difference across the fence line. What difference does that make if, you, if your soils aren't stressed all the time? Because then your plants aren't stressed. So what we find is if you get a cloud coming over these soils, the temperature changes dramatically. And it might be by 30 degrees just with a bit of cloud cover. And then the sun comes out and that soil bakes again. And then it gets cold. It gets cold at night. It's hot in the day. That is so stressful for plant roots. 
these soils, that temperature stays the same. Right? Have you ever been in a straw bale house or an earth house? See that, that buffering effect? It stops that massive fluctuation. That's what these soils build. Right? How do we build a soil that has that resilience? Okay. So what are the ways that we get that carbon into the soil? How do we get a biological system like that? What are, the way, what are you guys doing to get carbon into the soil? Trampling. So we're going to add organic matter that we're going to push down. What else are we going to do? Cover crops. Cover crops. Yes, great. So we're going to add a whole lot of organic material with your uh, tillage radish and things like that. Yep. What else have you got? What else are you doing? What I've been looking at spraying liquid carbon on it. Yeah, so like uh, what kind of liquid carbon? Monty's liquid carbon. Do you know what it is? Just Monty's. All right, no, that's cool. Uh, yeah, so there might be things like a humates or biochar or fulvic acids or a molasses, any of these things. So carbon means it once lived. So anything that's lived before counts as a carbon input. Yep, so we could be doing input, so it might be compost, it might be trampling. What else are the cows doing when they're trampling? Manure. Yeah, Urine. poos and wheeze. They're going to put that down on the soil. Uh, you might have root systems like that. I want you to be digging and finding root systems like that. If I have one criticism, what I'm seeing with adaptive grazing is people are looking above ground for recovery and not below ground. All right, and we're seeing diminishing root systems. Have you heard the tale of when they came into Nebraska and they were breaking that land up with a plow? You could hear that from a mile away because it sounded like bullwhips cracking of that root system snapping apart. All right, what do our root systems sound like now? All right, no one's hearing that from a mile away, right? How do we get our root system starting to be thick and fibrous and deep, right? Because what I find is most ranches, their root systems, we look at where 80% of their root systems are and you're an inch from a drought at any one time, right? Really shallow root systems. Dig holes, find out. So maybe it's your cover crops. Maybe it's running a diversity of organisms. Is that a um, musk ox? Yeah. A yak. Anyway, they got this in Paradise Valley. I'm like, that is the coolest flood <laughs> I've ever seen. Um, you know, different types of manure, different types of biologicals, different types of saliva. So some producers that I work with are putting prebiotics or probiotics out for animals, either as uh, free choice mineral or in their water troughs to inoculate their landscapes with microbiology, right? Very, very cost effective. You want to see manure break down in days, right? Days not years, right, cover crops. So thinking about the different types of root systems, and this is just all, I did this in New Zealand for New Zealand type plant species, but just to think of the different species that you've got out there, like mullen, I, I imagine it's got a root like that, right? Uh, obviously, your uh, lucerne is alfalfa in American. Um, is orchard grass. Orchard grass, yes, dandelion is dandelion, all right. So do we have different types of root architecture because they're feeding different types of microbiology? They are bringing up minerals. So you'll see some of the plants, like let's take knapweed. It's what we call a dynamic accumulator. What it does is it makes boron available and it brings it up through its roots and it actually releases available boron out through its root systems. It's healing that land, which is awesome if you want to wait like 100 years. You do that knapweed, that would be great. but. We can short circuit that by starting to learn to read what, am, what is this plant trying to tell me, right? What is the indicator for this species? So the more diversity, the different types of minerals they're releasing, the different types of exudates, they start to build these crumb structures. And I want to see root systems that look like this. This is both American examples. Uh, it shows up more on sandy soils, but uh, and some plants like oats, we'll dig up some oats today and we should see some really good rhizosheaths on those. So um, these are called rhizosheath. I call them the Rastafarian roots because they look like dreadlocks, man. Right? So great big dreadlocks. I had a couple white guys tell me that I was being culturally mis misappropriating a word. So I contacted a friend who's Rastafarian. I said, can you ask your community, are they happy if I 
talk about these roots as being Rastafarian. So he talked to his Facebook group and they came back and they were like, yeah, man, we're all about the roots. <laughs> so, so they're happy for me to call them Rastafarian. So do we have that soil sticking to that root system? Because it makes a huge difference in terms of resilience, in terms of health. If you're de dealing with things like um, alkali soil, if you have aluminum, if you have differences in pH, if you have waterlogged soils, detoxification, heavy metals, any of it comes down to do I have the root systems that look like that or that, right? And if you don't, if you have naked roots, then you have this system that's so vulnerable and so stressed, right? And then what happens is it dries out and in come the grasshoppers or it gets stressed and in comes the rust and the ergot and the mycotoxins and all that stuff comes in because these plants are stressed, right? The pH difference in that rhizosheath can be two units difference. So you might have a soil of nine pH, but your plant still experiences seven, or you might have a pH of five, it's still experiencing seven. This is the key to success, right? This is one thing we really wanna be focusing in on is do I have that? And if not, why? Why not? Okay, so I thought we'd play a game because I know you ranchers love playing games. So much so, but there's treats. I give you lollies, candy. Okay, so what I will get, if you can come with me, fine sir. Um, and your name was? Grady. Grady. All right, so Grady, I want you to imagine Grady's the plant. What is the plant doing every day? What's Grady out there doing? Growing. Sorry? Growing. growing. How does he grow? Photosynthesis. photosynthesis. So the process of photosynthesis, he's going to make sugar. So you can open that bag. All right. So Grady the plant is capturing sunlight energy, drawing in CO2, breathing out oxygen, and making sugar. What does that sugar turn into? What's that sugar? What does the sugar become? Carbon. Carbon? Yeah, so CHO, carbohydrate, carbon. So there's a carbon component in this, but what does that turn into? What does the plant make that into? Lignin. Yeah. Oh, you're brilliant. Yes, lignin, cellulose, uh, <coughs> protein, cell walls, sugar that it's pumping out the roots, all of it starts as this process of photosynthesis. So you're gonna have a plant root, so hold on to that. I can get you to come here, fine sir, and be a plant root. It's very painless, this one. You just have to eat candy. <laughs> eat okay, candy. eat candy, right. So everything that you're doing as a rancher starts as this process of photosynthesis. So you're gonna send some of the candy down to the root, all right. You might pocket one. Oh, oh yeah, you pocket. Uh, so the roots are gonna grow with that sugar and then keep passing that sugar down. And some of that, like up to 40%, you could be exuding, so just drop it on the ground. No, the sugar. <laughs> the sugar's on the ground, all right? So that plant, keep coming, keep coming. Sugar, drop it, excellent. All right, so the plant is sending out these sugars all the time, so I'm get you to be a bacteria. You can come up, you can eat some of those sugars, pick up the sugar. You don't have to do too much, I promise you, just eat the sugar. <laughs> All right, and then I've got another one in here somewhere. All right, there, fine, sir. All right, so these bacteria are gonna pick up those sugars and they're gonna eat it. <laughs> so, I want you to imagine that you've just had the best party of your life. It's been amazing and like you've had so many people and you've all been dancing. It's been a brilliant night and everyone's starting to leave. You turn the lights off. These two go and order pizza. They're the guys that no matter what won't leave the party. I don't know if that's true at all. No, you're very well behaved. All right. So they won't leave the party and what's happening is they go through that soil system. They're bringing in nutrients. Okay, they're going to bring in nitrogen, they're going to bring in phosphorus. And I want you to think of these two as being the fertilizer bag sitting in the shed. All right, so they're not going to give that nutrient up. All right, what we find in a lot of agricultural systems is this is what you have, what we call bacterially dominated soils. The nutrients bound up, 
I think of them as constipated. <laughs> right, they're constipated soils. They're not going to release that nutrient until someone comes along and eats them. Ah, so this is a protozoa. I've got a couple of protozoas. This one's a ciliate. Uh, you might have studied this one. It's called paramecium when you were at 15. You still remember? It's close enough for you to remember. All right. So these guys come through that soil. They're going to eat the bacteria. The bacteria stay, but I want you to take the nutrient. Oh, okay. Take the nitrogen and go get the other guy. Eat him. So they take... She takes that nutrient up, and then what you're going to do is you end up having too much nutrient than what you need in your body, so you're going to poop it on the root. <laughs> However, Americans do lovely, po so polite, so polite. You guys, so polite until you're behind the wheel of a vehicle or something. You know? <laughs> All right, so she's doing that. We also have what we call the good nematode, right? So good nematode is also... So you've got phosphorus. You're going to eat that guy and take his nutrients. So you've also got nitrogen. Uh, no, leave the bacteria there because he's not going anywhere. Right? And so you're going to take the nutrient from that plant. So take the nitrogen, Patrick. Take it. Okay, but instead of... Um, pooping, you're going to vomit on the root. <laughs> yes. Yeah, that's special. <laughs> All right, what's the plant going to do with those nutrients? Pass it up to the plant. Oh. What is the plant going to do with all that nitrogen and phosphorus? Grow. Grow. Very good. Okay. So, we have... We have bad nematode as well in the system. Okay, so get you to be bad nematode. Oh, can I get a boo? <laughs> boo, bad nematode. So bad nematode wants to eat the plant roots. Patrick, you're going to kung fu her. So, but not let, yeah, like stop her. She's not allowed to get near the roots. She wants to eat it. Very good. Push her outside. Just push her out there. Get, get. Right, good. Now stay there. So we've seen this on, like, actually microscopes have seen good nematode defend from the keep the defend that root from bad nematode because he doesn't want the sugar daddy drying up so if that root's damaged this whole sugar system breaks down and the nematode doesn't want that to happen because there's all this going on now what else is missing from this system what else have we got the fungi all right so we have our mycorrhizal fungi you're going to give me some give me a whole lot yes take those nutrients off you. All right, so what happens is you have a mycorrhizal fungi. So myco means fungus, rhizo means root. They can expand a hundred times what the plant is. And as they come down through the soil, they drop their sugars. Very good. Like that. All right, and they will come all the way down here. And what they find down here are things like bound up phosphate. They find zinc. Why do you need zinc? Why would a plant need zinc? Keeps you from getting COVID. Keeps you from getting <laughs> COVID. That's right. So we're going to bring some zinc and some nitrogen. So what in the in the pathway it goes, a hundred percent of phosphorus comes from this relationship with mycorrhizae, right? All your zinc comes from this relationship with mycorrhizae. Nitrogen can come from other sources, but it's a very important pathway. Oh, and then we have water, right? So water, that mycorrhizae is much finer and much longer than the plant root. So it brings up water to that plant. What's the plant going to do with all of that? Woo! -hoo! And be very happy and send out its sugar. It's lovely. The bacteria can get that. Um, so... When we've been doing our plant tissue testing on rangeland, we find you guys are very low in phosphorus and very low in zinc. Some of you have nil zinc. Why do, you need, why do cows need zinc apart from COVID? <laughs> why would a cow need zinc? To breed. To breed, that's right. So very important for reproduction. Zinc is what controls the wiggle on the tail of a sperm. So if you don't have zinc, those tails don't wiggle, strangely enough. Uh, you'll see weeping eyes 
or pink eye, we'll see a, a bare patch at the top of the clove of the hoof. There'll be no hair growing there as one of the visual indicators. Scabs on teats, so in dairies we see scabs on teats as an indicator of a low zinc, right? So very important for human health as well. Immunity, all right? Just one of our best immunity things. What do we need phosphorus for? What do the cows Bones. need? Sorry? Bones. Bones, yes. Bones, bone structure. Reproduction again, right? Energy. Sorry? Energy. Energy. So the skipping cows that we see, that's all about phosphorus. If they don't have enough phosphorus, we will see cows that are just so easy to handle. It's like, no, they're just like zombie apocalypse or something, right? So phosphorus is very important for energy, reproduction, health, growth, right? Plant growth, root growth. So if we see low phosphorus in the leaf samples, what we'll see are very shallow roots. Right, we don't have enough phosphorus to get those roots going. So we need to have a mycorrhizal relationship. What things do we do to disrupt this relationship, do you think? What might shed that relationship with mycorrhizae? Turn the yeah, so sure. If we cultivate it, gone. What other things might shed that relationship? Herbicide. Yes. So herbicides. So they've shown that if you apply glyphosate, the following year, mycorrhizal colonization reduces by 25% every year. So we're gradually knocking away. But the glyphosate or your herbicide might take out protozoa. So you can sit down, milady. Um, so protozoa is gone. All right, what other things do we do to disrupt or disturb a soil? Overgraze. Overgraze. So we're coming back. We're going to repeat and nip that plant. So now that plant's like, dude, I'm not giving you any sugar. I got to look after myself. So the good nematode will go. All right. Uh, we might have poor water management, all right? So we might be waterlogging these soils, all right? That's going to have an impact. And what we start to see is we see a lot of bacteria in this system. And you, my lady. So uh, what do you want to do? What's your job? Destroy. Yeah. Des destroy him. To destroy? Yes. Yeah, go. Go for it. So, yeah. So the, the roots become very pathetic. Right, you can sit down. Thank you. And so what we end up with is these very short root systems. You don't get any of this now, buddy. All right. Okay. And very bacterial. All right. So when we look at root, um, root structures and root health, what I find in rangeland is a huge amount of insect or nematode damage on those roots. So you want to be digging a hole. In New Zealand, you cost New Zealand agriculture $1 billion a year in lost production. So that's New Zealand. So the numbers have got to be much, much higher here in the US, right? So we have huge, huge harm happening from this organism because that food web is not intact, all right? So what are we going to have to do now for this plant? How's that plant going to grow? That's right. You're going to have someone drive up the driveway who goes, I have the solution for you, buddy. All right. Then what are you going to do for water? Well, yeah, we're going to have to irrigate, drill a well, or just whine and complain. <laughs> All right. A lot of complaining. New Zealanders in two weeks are in a drought. All right. That's how long it takes for New Zealand to be declared a drought. All right. We're two weeks without water <laughs> because we have these systems. All right. Very bacterial very compacted, very shallow root systems. Now we're also going to have grasshoppers, right? This is the signal for grasshoppers, right? Very bacterial dominated, very poor fungal, very low mycorrhizae, very low po plant defense. And we'll find, we'll measure plant ph photosynthesis, and we'll do this in the field today, is your plant bricks or photosynthesis will be very low. Like we want a grass to be above 12% sugar. Most grasses we find are around five to seven, if not three, all right? So our photosynthetic pathway, which is what's driving all of that carbon deep into the soil, gets degraded when the system starts to happen, okay? Any questions about that? You've been so good, thank you all. Um, what have I got? I got a, I got a treat for you you're the first victim. This is a tardigrade, which is a six-legged creature that lives in the soil. They eat algae. Uh, they can survive below absolute zero and above boiling. 
They can desiccate their bodies to 3% of their water and survive for hundreds of years until you put a drop of water and they come back to life. They are the coolest things to watch. They can survive 10,000 times the radiation of a human. They sent them into outer space and they came back alive. Not very happy, but they came back alive. All right, so there are some amazing mysteries in soil that could help solve so many of the issues that we deal and with. And they're not bacteria? No, they're a little six-legged creature and they're about a millimeter in size so we can nearly see them. You guys don't understand millimeter, but one twenty-fifth of an inch, right, in size, right, these tiny little guys. They're super they're cool. Also called Water bears or water piglets are their more commonly known names. All right, thanks guys, you can sit down. <coughs> Give them a round of applause, that was cool. I know, I know cowboys hate doing that. <laughs> hate it. At least I didn't say role play. We're gonna do a role play now. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Don't do that to us. Don't do that. How are we going for time? So we have 15 minutes. Yeah. We could either just go now. Yeah. If you want to take a break and we can head to the field mm -hmm. or you could give us, you know, a little bit more. I don't. I'm kind of leaning towards getting in the field. Okay. Let's go. Unless. My lady's got a sore butt. Unless you have like five or 10 minutes you want to. I always do, but let's go. Okay. Be fun. Nicole, I do have one question. Yes. I was wondering. I know in Montana last year, a lot of you know there was the gr a lot of people had the grasshoppers. Yeah. And I'm wondering if places like the Indrelands, who I know through the Kavira program, and like were there places where you've been doing work where they had a lot more resilience yeah, because totally. of because that's what I'd heard from various yeah. people up there, or the people who'd been really focusing on soil did yeah. not have the same level of damage. No. To date, to compare some of the areas I've been to, um, some ranches that are on about five inches are being absolutely slammed. They have nothing. Even the, even the crested wheat's been eaten. <laughs> Those grasshoppers have taken all of their deferred grazing. And the indolins, um, there are grasshoppers in there, but they're not, I mean, the, the grass looks like normal grass. But there's still grasshopper there. But they did some measurements up around Glasgow area. So if you're over 15 grasshoppers per yard, you're at a critical number. They counted 180 grasshoppers in a square yard up there. Like they're all over the road. Someone sent me a picture from the meteorological thing and it was looked like rain was coming to Glasgow. We were like, yay, but it was grasshoppers at 10,000 feet on, on the rain radar. It's terrifying up there but they are going around properties that are looking after nutrition. It's not to say you'll never have a grasshopper, but we've seen this again and again, and I've got some really good fence line images of no crop to crop where they've got um, nutrition, right? So addressing nutrition, getting your grazing right is absolutely critical if we want to get rid of the grasshoppers. They did some work in Ohio State University. Um, they showed that in insects, um, they prefer what we call incomplete proteins. We can measure incomplete proteins because your bricks will be very low. Right? The bricks in your plant will be low. Um, so low bricks. Um, and again, low boron has, but boron has a relationship with insects um, and low, no, high high sap pH. So these are basically the, the critical um, breakdown. So we get an incomplete protein when there's stress, when there's low carbon, and low biology. So we've done some things to complete proteins that are, uh, especially in hay fields, that can be really effective. I know some people are putting on like some, you can use molasses. Um, so to complete a protein, we need some carbon form. So we've been using milk, we've been using humic acid, we've been using um, molasses to complete the proteins. And I wouldn't do this just on the range unless, I mean, you could. Ooh, it's gradually going. I need an adult. Um, <laughs> So to complete those proteins, we might be using one or two pints of molasses. We might use, per acre, per acre two pints of humic acid. Um, uh, we also use 
milk at two gallons an acre for milk, all right? And that looks much better, thank you. So one to two pints of molasses. And you can try this for yourself, and we could do this in the field today, is you can sketch out like one yard by one yard and get a spray bottle and trial some of these things. Right? It's not, it's not rocket science, doesn't have to be hard. And we could try all these things and see what lifts the bricks the most. So let's say we're doing molasses, two pints of humic acid. So what would that be like, humic acid? What that um, so you have, uh, they, they make it from humates. So humates are your soft brown coal. You guys here have some of the best soft brown coal in the world. In fact, New Zealand and Australia imports their humate from North Dakota. Like that's, that's the humate that we use, that's the best quality comes from North Dakota. Um, and they chemically react it to make your humic acid. It's a very soluble, very concentrated carbon because where did humate come from? Where did coal come from? Carbon. Carbon, just 65 million year old carbon that's all been, was kilometers deep that's now been concentrated down, right? Um, and so we get a response from that and then you could do two gallons of milk and what we do is we set up a little transect, so this will be one yard by one yard, and we're gonna, we're gonna calculate how much would that be. So two gallons of milk is two mils. So you think a pint is a tiny bit if we're talking about a yard, so we do two mils of milk. We could do a few, like a drop of humic, and you're gonna put this into a spray bottle, right, that might have uh, five, ounces of water in it and you're going to spray that and try it and you could try different things so you can go milk humic you could do seaweed you could do fish anything like that these biological carbon based foods and then measure the bricks that bricks you want to see that bricks come up now how long do you give it for you to measure the bricks uh 40 minutes so come back 40 minutes later. So it's a fun thing to do with the kids while they're on holiday. Let's go out and spray some stuff. You want to see it come up by like three or four bricks. We did it uh, at the Indulins recently with um, Vermicast. Um, and when we, when we came in, it had dropped it by three. And I was like, uh-oh, I think we overdid it. So we saved it for a week and we came back and measured a week later and it had come up by seven. So it had gone from 13 bricks to 20. Why that bricks is important is obviously, you know, this is what's driving our carbon, this is what's feeding microbiology, but a one unit or 1% increase in bricks gives you the equivalent of 0.1 pound of weight gain per animal per day. It's huge, all right? So if you go from 13 to 20 bricks, that's 0.7. That's nearly a pound of weight gain per animal per day. So pastures that I work with with um, guys that have been doing this for a while is their bricks is up above 20. You can taste it. Like it's so sweet, mm, so yummy. And working with dairy farmers, they measure this. If their fields are running at 13, but their next field's 20, they're going to miss that 13 field. And if they're up on those uh, 20 degree bricks fields, 20% sugar, it's the equivalent of $3,000 in additional revenue a week that these guys are making by chasing the high bricks. Okay? So this is all about nutrition. This is all about your job is to capture sunlight energy. How well can you do that? How well can you get this system functioning? Okay? Any questions about that? So go home and have a try with this. It's really fun. Um, there's lots of different products on the market. Uh, if it's a trace element that you're missing, like maybe it is boron, um, then come back a week later and measure it, right? You're not gonna see the instant response to it, uh, to the trace elements, okay? Um, that exercise time on rangeland is known as <coughs> Yeah, so we're doing it on rangeland. We're so when I first came to the States, I was like, no one's going to treat their rangeland and get out with a sprayer. And now I'm working with people that are doing it and seeing phenomenal responses. And I've got a whole lot of case studies of people doing it on rangeland. So if you know that you're willing to do, take some action, then do it. If you, if you aren't, then don't do it. But 
we are typically seeing, um, yeah, a three to six percent, three to six degree increase in bricks from these applications. So, um, guys I work with are treating about two and a half thousand acres a year, and that's just next year they'll do the next bit and keep going around because once that brick starts working, that whole system starts to work. You don't have to keep coming back and doing it if you're a good grazing manager. So if you've already got that grazing part done, because that's your number one key. Don't start with biologicals if you've got crap management. So just from a practical standpoint, then spraying this on with... Yes. Yeah, so working with some guys out of Reno, they're 370,000 acres, they're doing it with aircraft. And they're paying $8 an acre for application. Right, so if you can get it, a plane cheap enough, and you should, because your fuel is so much cheaper here than in New Zealand. Like, it's crazy. Anyway, um, yeah, so you could do it with aircraft, especially some of this really rough country. But you want to figure out what is it that's the missing out here that's going to give me the biggest bang for my buck. And you can, you can work that out by doing this stuff. So even if it was a little trace element, you don't want to be putting a product on that doesn't give you any feedback in terms of a lift in bricks. You're wasting your time and money. And I think a lot of people are doing that. So work this out first and then... With your soil test. Yeah, you could with do it with the soil need. test, with, with what, what you need. need. Yeah. So have a look, is it? So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna send a recipe that we've been making that's a trace element chelated brew that if you wanted to buy it commercially, it costs $50 an acre and we're making it for a dollar. Um, and we're finding this is just a real catalyst for what's going on. You've got to have a look because it's got four different trace elements in it to see do I need those trace elements and if you didn't, take it out. But um, we're seeing some amazing returns with that. Um, okay, let's go out in the field, dig some holes. All right.